Studentpreneur, the podcast about students who are entrepreneurs. Get motivated and keep your energy high. Stories from Studentpreneurs. Welcome to episode 17. My name is Julian Martin, entrepreneur turned PhD student. Each week, I bring you the best of those individuals who are student and entrepreneurs. I call them studentpreneurs. This week, our studentpreneur is Samuel Dinaro. This is an awesome episode because Samuel started very early on and uh, he's got quite a bit of experience and now 24 is going to be telling us his journey through his failures and success. All right, let's get into it. So we've got Samuel Dimaro with us today. Samuel is 24 and he's um, studying at the Oxford Brook University uh, through long distance. He lives in Zimbabwe and he runs currently Aura Group. He's going to tell us a bit more about it and he built Chenkit SI previously. His highest annual revenue uh, was $2 million one year. And did I forget anything? Oh, no, of course. I forgot to say that you are the global finalist of the Global Student Entrepreneur Awards of this year. And also you earned the prize of Creative Young Entrepreneur of the Year. Did I forget anything, <laughs> Samuel? Okay, good. So I'm from Zimbabwe, which is in Southern Africa. Many people know the country Zimbabwe for the wrong things, but it's a very beautiful country that everybody who comes here falls in love with them. It's a very nice place to be. I live in Harare, which is the capital city, and I grew up in Harare, in Zimbabwe, yes. How many habitants in, uh, in Harare? Harare has a population of, it's estimated between two and three million people, and the country's population is about 13 million people. Okay, pretty good sized city. All right, so how got you started on that journey of entrepreneurship? Like, how old were you, like, were you primary school, high school, do you remember? Okay, so my business journey started when I was in high school. And it started off when I read financial journals. You know, during break time, most others would be playing, I would be reading newspapers, acquainting myself with financial markets. It's something I found interesting. And my dad gave me a book to read, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which was, yeah, which was very interesting. And, you know, as someone who was already kind of business minded, I just fell in love with the book and the ideas that it up and that's what got me started so you you broke the mindset of getting education getting your job instead you just started a business exactly so what attracted you in financial journals at the age of 15 well by then i did read rich dead poor dead and i'm like okay my objective was to make money <laughs> well which is it what every businessman wants to do <laughs> we were not ashamed of making money <laughs> yeah so my motivation was to make money And I said, okay, maybe a good place to start is the stock market. We had, you know, a bit of inflation in our country. And, um, you know, inflation, I think by then in 2006, uh, there about, you know, inflation was in the uh, double to triple digit range. So Sorry, it was double digits, even triple? Uh, yeah, that, that's crazy. That's... Yes. Yeah. Well, the, that was the beginning because by the time we stopped using our local currency, inflation was about 8 billion percent per annum and prices were doubling every 15 hours or something like that. So basically you buy, I don't know, a credit for the phone on the first day of the month and by the end of the month, the same card is worth what, 20 times? <laughs> nothing? Well, it's worth nothing basically because if I bought a loaf of bread for $10, never mind about the end of the month, tomorrow that loaf will be $20. And then the next day, it will be $40. Then the next day, it will be $80. <laughs> so anyway, in about 2006, the inflation was still double or triple digits, which is a lot by global standard. But that was the beginning. So there was lots of speculation happening in the market. And I was like, look, let me get into the stock market and get in that game. So then I was still too young to invest and, be, and hold an account with a brokerage firm. So I used my mother's national identification to open an account under her name so that I could trade. <laughs> and that's what, so I started trading when I was 15. And um, from then I used to make my own pocket money. Well, I never used to ask my parents for pocket money because I was making enough to sustain myself for the little things that a 15-year-old cares about. <laughs> so hang on, hang on. Did your mother, did she know that you use her details to, to do that? Yeah, no, she was fully aware of okay, it good. Uh, because good. I had to ask her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so from then on, you were kind of independent for all the small stuff. Yeah, for all the small stuff, yeah. And um, How did they feel? You know, at, at school, my, 
Well, it felt nice to know that, look, I can be able to do what I want when I want. Um, and uh, look, okay, my, my parents raised me well. And I, of course, was responsible. Even though I had money, I, I was also responsible with it. I didn't go crazy and start doing all sorts of funny things that teenagers enjoy, which are, can be harmful. <laughs> but uh, I, I always used it for good use. Then my friends, um, you know, saw the success I was having playing in the stock market. And they were like, look, we want to give you our money to invest for us. So I actually signed contracts with my friends at school. So they'll give me money. I'll invest on their behalf. If we made money. So you were a broker for them? Oh, yeah. I was like a fund manager. Yeah, okay. Fund manager. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A fund manager who promise they made it, that would share money if we made, would share the profit if we made a profit. But if we made a loss, I was indemnified from the loss. So basically, can I, but jo- I never can made I join? any losses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so it was quite interesting. Uh, of course, it was probably illegal, but I didn't know that. And uh, we, we were all minors and couldn't enter into contracts, but we all had some sort of understanding anyways, and nothing ever went, never, ever went wrong. Well, that's the beauty of being a student entrepreneur. Like you don't really have to know all the rules, right? Because you're underage. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. So just get on with it, and uh, you know you will learn as you go. But hang on, you were um, so you're buying and selling stocks online, like from other markets or from Zimbabwe? Just in Zimbabwe only. So our market is a manual market. It was a manual market then. A manual market. Yeah. So imagine back in the days in the banks. That the banking sector, imagine banks with no systems and how they would be processing transactions and you'd have to go with a book, those little booklets for them to record you. So you can imagine that kind of era, that's where our market was. So that's where my first business idea came. So one day I sat down after reading one of Rich Dad's, one of Robert Kiyosaki's books, and I'm like, look, I'm going to make a list of 20 things that can be done in Zimbabwe. And uh, I made my list of 20 things and I decided to zero in on one thing. And this one thing was automating our capital markets in Zimbabwe. That's pretty big, but that sounds actually, you had no competition, right? Nobody did it. Well, many people were trying to do it in different ways, but they had all failed. They had been talking about this automation project, 696, when I was six years old. So by the time I was 17, which was 11 years later, no one had done anything. So me being young and naive, I was like, oh, okay, if these old guys can't do it, I'm going to come and do it. Yeah, I'm going to go and find software developers. We're going to write a system and provide this platform for these guys to automate. Because when you automate a capital market, you first have to establish what's first called the central depository system. This is a clearing, a custo- an electronic custody clearing and settlement platform for security. So just think of it as a banking system so that when people want to transact, they deposit their stock and shares. And when you trade those shares, you want the money and the shares to move electronically between accounts. Where did you find the developers? They were all local. So locals, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Local. My my brother is, is a my brother Jerome is a software developer, and uh, but he's based in Joburg, so he kind of referred me to his friends that were local, and you know, I eventually partnered up with a number of developers and uh, worked on it. Going on with that, we were initially wanting to write some software, and we embarked on this project in two thousand and eight. And then the Securities Commission of Zimbabwe got established. So instead of us providing a system to the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange, the Securities Commission was then mandated to oversee a scheme for setting up of a central securities depository. So what a central securities depository is, is the company that operates the CESD system. So instead of this being an arm of the stock exchange, they said, let this be an independent company. And when the stock exchange trades, they integrate to the CDS system and you only have one CDS system in a country and you can have like 15 stock exchanges. So, for example, in America, you've got the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, which is the CSD in the US, but you've got like 20 stock exchanges. But they all do their clearing and settlement through DTCC. The clearing house is, an, is in one place. Exactly. So in London, there's Crest. In the Europe, there's Euroclear. So now the Securities Commission said, look, we want a tender for people to come in set up this company on a 10 key basis with the technology, the finance, the people, right? And all of a sudden, we had to throw out everything we had done because now the regulator said, we want something that's been working for five years. And a system that we developed had not been working for five years. So we basically had to change strategy from being a system provider to actually establishing the company. So we had to look for resources. 
We had to register the company. We had to staff it. And um, yeah, it, it was quite a process. But I think, you know, between 2008 and 2010, when the tender process happened, we had been prepared so much that by the time the tender came in 2010, we were ready for it. And there's no one that could ah, match us. So you knew about the tender in 2008, but it only came through in 2010. No, in 2008, we didn't know there was ever going to be a tender. We were just interested in providing a solution. But, you know, we, as time went uh, forward, you know, a tendering process had to happen. But by the time the tendering process, we had already been working, working on it so much. So you had experience to show. So your resume didn't matter. Like the fact that you were young didn't matter. But because you'd been operating for a few years then. Well, I was young and I was irrelevant. I had no qualifications to my name. So, But the developers had all the credentials. They were very qualified. Uh, in fact, we had one person that had a doctorate and had 20 years experience in Europe. So one thing I learned as a student entrepreneur is that, you know, you can tackle even the big problems, national problems, international problems. You don't have to know everything, but you just have to be able to put a team together and get people to buy into your vision of what you're trying to achieve. I remember by the time we had to then set up the company as a central securities depository, we now had to go out and look for additional partners. We, we managed to bring in one of the largest chances secretaries in Zimbabwe, which would be a key stakeholder in this process. And uh, they had been in business for the past 15 years, very respected with 40% market share and very experienced, uh, you know, where the chartered accountant there with over 20, who was a chartered accountant for the past 25 years. And, you know, we also had, um, you know, MTN in Iran. You know, when MTN was, yeah, there's, there, there's a mobile cellular network called the MTN. So the one in Iran, uh, when it was started many years ago, there are five people that went and literally set up that network from zero to 25 million subscribers. Now, we had one of those five guys on our team as well. Ah, okay. So you've got yeah, people that are used to big, you know, to solve big problems. Okay. But hang on, hang on. When you brought that partner on board, like how, like you were sitting in the same room, you know, and, you know, you don't look like you're 40, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so how, how did you, were you scared? Like, how did that work for you? No, not even not scared. Scared for what? <laughs> I was, uh, I believed in my abilities. I'd been investing in the market since I was 15. And by the time I was oh, 17, wow. 18, 19, I had detailed domain knowledge that some people didn't even know. And with me being young and understanding technology, on the team, I was the youngest and about 80% of the team were double my age or more. Okay. So there was only one or two guys that were, actually, yeah, one or two guys that were probably 20 years old. No, no, that were not double my age at that time. But I mean, at the end of it all, if you sit down and you've got a good idea, and it's bankable, you know, people will listen to you and they'll give you the audience. And look, it's a, it was an opportunity for everyone to make money. So I was going to make money, they were going to make money too. So Yeah, no, no, that's right. That's, right. That, that's pretty impressive. So then you built, now you're running another company. So how did you move from one to another? Okay, so maybe I'll just quickly fast forward and give you the rest of this project. So um, Chenge Tedzai, when we were then setting up that CST, we tend that we won in, at the end of 2010 after a seven-month tender process which had lots of going back and forth. Yeah. But we eventually won it. And, um, you know, in terms of setting up, now we had won the tender, but the problem we now had was dealing with breaking down the dinosaur that was there. Yeah. Because the way the market was operating, it was a dinosaur and it was full of many old boys. You know, because it's paper-based, there was lots of fraud happening and there were people with... With skeletons in their cabinet. Yeah, and you were exposing everything with your automated system. <laughs> oh, and we were a threat, a huge threat. So literally between 2011 and 2012, we literally spent fighting politics, right? Poly po project politics, um, you know, f you know, and then no bank wanted, no, no investor wanted to put in money in the project. And we were promoters and we had to pump in, you know, hundreds of thousands. And no one else wanted to put money because... They thought maybe the old boys might be strong enough to destroy our project because that was their interest. They wanted mm -hmm. this project to fail. Yeah, but uh, we eventually won. And, um, you know, what happened was that this project, the government got wind that we were setting this up. So I think when the tendering was, was happening, nobody thought this project was as big as it is. And all of a sudden, when the cabinet saw that this project uh, would be carrying 
uh, you know, over half the country's GDP in financial securities, they wanted us, they didn't say, look, government has to have a strategic interest through institutional entities that the government owns. So you've, on our shareholders, we've got three government banks, uh, the Social Security, National Social Security Scheme, and, um, and the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. So, so the, the government then made it compulsory for them to own 51% but through these entities. So the good thing about it is that since we're dealing with professional institutional investors, it's kept it, everything going on well. So we then signed a shareholders agreement, capitalized the company. It's basically a joint venture then. Yeah, so it's now, it's a joint venture now. So we implemented the project and we finished the pro- implementing in 2013. And then now after dealing with all this politics and getting the market on board and we have the system ready, then we now had a le- legislation issue that no laws were there to enable our company to start operating. And then, you know, the, things had to go through parliament and the like and eventually passed. And then we started operating in September 2014. So between September 20, 2014 and to date, we have... We now have a deposit base of uh, $1.3 billion in securities that are on our system as we speak. And uh, we've done transaction clearing and settlement for over $250 million so far. So our business model is that we get a percentage of every transaction that happens on our platform. Yeah, you, you clip every transaction. But before that, how did you make money? Be, you know, between 2008 and 2014? Okay, so between 2008 and 2014, so that's one business venture. I had another company that I was involved in where we were doing banking systems and uh, we were doing like, because in our country, we had hyperinflation till 2008. Then we got rid of our local currency and started using multiple currencies. So that's the rand, the US dollar, pound, the euro, you know, in our, um, in our country. So literally the economy hit the reset button in 2008 and we had to start from scratch. So everything was back to the basics. And I was uh, with one of these IT guys that we partnered with on Chengete Zai. We were also, he was also doing some things in the banking sector. Then we also partnered with him in his company to start doing things in the banking sector, solutions in the banking sector. And that's kind of what, what uh, made us. He was very experienced and came from abroad, but didn't have local knowledge like I did. So during that period, we implemented the national payment system for the tax authority. And uh, it's a platform that is used by the our tax authority to collect taxes and receipt taxes online. That's for all the taxes in the country. So I think, which is about $4 billion a year in taxes revenue that our systems were receiving and processing online. All right. In terms of employee, like how many employees did you have? Okay. So in my other former company uh, that I was involved with, we had with about 15 employees, about 10 of those were engineers and then five we administrative staff and sales staff. Wow. And then Chengete Zai has about 13 permanent employees as we speak. And Oda Group has uh, 10 permanent employees. All right. And so what type of skills did you learn from one business and you transferred from, from another? Like, did you learn from one business to another? Like from your first business of being a fund manager to becoming a JV with the government? Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing that, you know, I certainly, my financial skills certainly developed over time. You know, I was pursuing at the same time. So from 2008, there about, I dropped out of school. Ah, so you dropped out of school. Yeah, it's, when I started working on my business in 2008, I dropped out of school. And um, I was doing accounting. So one thing I learned was that, you know, I learned how to quickly put financial models together to quickly assess whether it makes sense to pursue a particular investment or do a particular project and to see if it makes financial sense. And, you know, also valuation to, you know, to value your company and value what you're worth and see if you're selling off a stake, what the price should be, those kinds of things. You know, I I learned that. I also learned, you know, diplomacy. One of my mentors taught me that, (laughs) uh, you know, diplomacy is about telling someone to go to hell, but to send them there smiling. (laughs) So... (laughs) So sometimes when you're dealing in these large projects, you've got to understand diplomacy very well and you've got to deal with people. That's one of the most important skill, skills, you know, networking with people and dealing and managing people. Yeah, no, that's, you had you definitely had to learn that, definitely. So you, you just said that you dropped out of school. So how did you manage balancing going to school and running your business? Okay. 
Yeah, that, that's the most exciting question. <laughs> so I dropped out of high school with two years left, but I dropped out of high school to start pursuing chartered accountancy and my degree program. And what I then did was uh, I self-studied all the way through, so I never entered a single class. And all I would simply get to... So you didn't go to class? No, I never went to a single class. Wow. So you, I don't know if you've heard of ACCA, the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants. Yes, so I did that without entering a single classroom. Also, my Oxford Brooks degree program, I did it without entering a single classroom. So I'll be an entrepreneur by day and uh, study by night. That's how I, because the classes just didn't work with my skills. You know, when you're an entrepreneur, you don't have the flexibility and freedom to do whatever you want whenever you want, you know, um, because, you know, if I'm an entrepreneur and I have to go and meet a minister or if go and strike a business deal, and I have to leave, go leave the house at 7 p.m. to go and do that. Then, And if I've got a class, then it clashes, you know. So I just kind of self And of course, like anyone, because I didn't go to class, I took longer. But one of the things I valued was to say, I value making an impact more than the piece of paper that I have. Well, you did leverage what you learned because you were, you were studying accounting. And so you did say that you learned about building models and scenarios and valuation. Well, that's... That's what you learned from class as well. So it was, you were improving your business and you were improving your studies as well. Yeah, at the same time, kind of doing it in, in, in parallel. Because one of the things that's important with student entrepreneurs is to say, look, at the end of the day, there's no direct correlation between the qualification someone has and competence. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there are, there are many people who have brilliant qualifications, but are a disaster when it comes to the workplace. And I've got a good analogy. If you look at most of the billionaires, how many people are there that have doctorates that are billionaires? <laughs> Not that many. <laughs> Not that many. And in many cases, those that get doctorates, some of them are honorary doctorates. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> if you see a billionaire with not one they studied for and became a doctor. It's because he donated a lot of money to the university. <laughs> exactly, you know. <laughs> it's that, that gives a possibility. <laughs> so what happened when you had to drop out of uni? What, what did drop out of... Was it uni or was it a high school? What did your parents say? Well, I basically showed, demonstrated to them that I was dropping out with a plan. I wasn't just doing it blindly. That I was going to continue furthering my studies whilst pursuing business at the same time. And something that I'd always been doing even when I was in high school, during my holidays, I would uh, go and um, work for free during my school holidays at various companies, you know, family, friends and stuff, just to gain experience and get involved in the marketplace. That's what I'll do. And it proved very valuable. So by the time I dropped out pursuing studies at school, my peers that continued with high school and went on to get degrees, they finished their degrees sometime. Last, most of them finished by, end, by last year. But the difference between me and them was that by last year, I had uh, seven years experience. <laughs> That's right. Right. I've started, uh, uh, you know, I, I've been in, started two successful businesses and I exited the third business that I got involved in. And, uh, you know, I've managed to make more money than I'll ever have made, even if I had gotten the best paying job out of college. Then, you know, at the same time, I've gotten some national and international recognition as well. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. You, you, We now both have qualifications, but I'm, I'm a few steps ahead of them. A few steps, yeah, a lot of steps. You're right. You're right. That's seven years of experience that they don't have. They they have a piece of paper, but and they've done a few internship, but that's all they've got. Whereas, as you said, you thought about a list of twenty ideas that you could bring to Zimbabwe, focus on one, and then build models and build it from there. I mean, like that's a lot of experience. So, and just interestingly enough, those twenty ideas I came up with, I actually then implemented three of those. I've got the list, but I don't have it on me right now. But, <laughs> you know, out of those 20 ideas, you know, about eight of those made people lots of money. Maybe I didn't do it myself, but it made people a lot of money. I think you've, you've said it a lot. How, how do you learn? You learn a lot from experience and you learn, a lot of learn from asking people and from practicing early on. Do you, is there also books that you read, podcast or key people that you talk to that you want to share with us? Okay, so I've got a lot of books that I read. Uh, I know Robert Kiyosaki's books on Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cashflow Quadrant, Retire Young, Retire Rich, Guide to Investing. I read a whole bunch of those. I've also read uh, Think and Grow Rich, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Also, 
Million Dollar Habits by Brian Tracy, Goals by Brian Tracy. So those are some of the books I have. And I've always looked for as many books as possible. The list of books is many. These are just a tip in the iceberg. But these, those are some of the main ones. So you read a lot. Yeah. In fact, this year, um, my goal is to read 15 books and I've read about five so far. That's good. So you, give you, you gave you an objective of this year, of the list of books. And uh, meanwhile, you're running two businesses and you're studying, right? <laughs> Stay studying, yeah. <laughs> and I have a girlfriend as well. <laughs> oh, you manage to have a social life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's one thing. I, I have lots of audios and, you know, in my car, whenever I'm moving between different points, I always make it a point to listen to some audios because we spend lots of time in the car. Audio books, yeah. I've also got a couple of mentors here, uh, Laxon Zembe, Mofa Chikuni, Campbell Msiwa, you all, all, a whole bunch of local people here, Anthony Cates, Nikhil Bolabai. I've got many local mentors as well. How did you meet them? Uh, well, it all happened, all happened progressively. The first one being Laxon Zembe, uh, we, we go to church together. Yeah, we go to church together. So although now we now go to different branches, but of the same church, he was his you know, very respected in the business arena. And he actually heard that I was doing something in business and he got hold of me and said, you must come and see me so that I teach you a few lessons so that you, when you go out in the market, you don't get, uh, <laughs> you don't get your fingers bent. So the, ever since then, we started working with him. Uh, and, you know, now here and then, you know, I get to, you know, speak to him whenever I'm stuck with something. And also other people. When I'm So you still talk to him. That's good. You no, know, I still talk to him very regularly and many of my other mentors. If I'm stuck with something, I know that if it's a legal matter, I've got this lawyer who's my legal advisor and mentor. I've got Mrs. Laxon Zembe, who's my business advisor. I've got Nikhil Bulaba, who's my strategic mentor. So depending on what the situation is, I'll just call them, hear them out, see what they, they have to say based on their experience. And it's, then you then just take a blend of everything and come up with a good, good strategy to solve the problem. But it's good, like you've got different mentors with different areas of expertise. Yes, yes, yes. that's very important. What other supports do you think you have in terms of community or you don't really have relationship with your professors because it's long distance, right? Yeah, yeah, no. But you are connected. Do you, you've developed a, a network in your community though? Yeah, I've, I've developed it. Yeah, I think you did it through like to begin with all the internships that you did in all those companies and then you just build on that. Yeah, and also the businesses over the years. You know, before one thing succeeds in business, you probably try 20 or 30 different things. So as you are going in this maze, you meet different people, connect with different people, diverse industries. And my internship started when I was 14 years old. Oh, my God. So whilst, whilst everybody <laughs> does internships in college, I started internships when I was 14 years old. I was working at McDonald's and I didn't learn a thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, you learned customer service yeah, and you learned customer service. You now, how to be accountable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got to help customers and irritate your customers. So, out of every situation, there's always something to learn, even in the most menial job. When I was doing an internship, I was a clerk, an audit and accounts clerk. And I remember sometimes uh, I'll get sent for assignments out of the country with an audit team. And they'll be like, oh, this one is the youngster. Give him this box of receipt books of course. to go through <laughs> and start checking every receipt book one by one. But it taught me discipline. It taught me something about, you know, even in business that whenever you're doing something, always check, cross check, triple check, quadruple check before anything goes out so that you get the most perfect thing out there. Yeah, maybe not perfect, but as close to perfection as possible. And you said, um, you know, you have to try 20 things for one thing to work. Do you have examples of failures that you had on, on your journey? Oh, yeah. Many failures. Many failures. Uh, I don't even know. Probably more failures than successes. <laughs> well, much more failures. <laughs> you know, um, one of the things that I once failed, it was at managing relationships. You know, I once, you know, with my partner in business, we wanted to set up this you know, large IT company, which was going to shake waves in Zimbabwe and in Southern Africa, because we just brought an A team from everywhere. Right. And, uh, you know, it also meant we brought in a lot of egos and there were a lot of chefs in the kitchen. Right. And, uh, we, you know, I, I got to work with one of these guys who was, you know, 
an expert and, you know, I really developed a good relationship with this guy and I learned a lot from him. But the problem that he had he was that on the back end, he also was uh, maneuvering and uh, having his other own agendas running. So I was young and I didn't. Then eventually, because of my association with him, I isolated myself from everybody else. Then when everything fell apart and the wheels came off, I was left in the coals with and he had gone his way, gone back and relocated to South Africa. And I'm there, I'm all alone and starting again from square one. Yeah, but this is a lesson that you learn very early on. Like this happens to anybody in their career, but you learn that in your teens. <laughs> like that's Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, or, or, or feeling, dej- you know, I remember even, you know, I almost cried. I was close to tears because it was just traumatizing. But what I also learned is to say, look, Never make business too personal, right? And never get too emotionally attached to an idea or a business because sometimes you become sentimental about it and in your being sentimental, you can you know, end up losing a lot. So yeah, that's one thing. Another failure was, you know, uh, you know raising money. You know, I remember with Chenge Tedzai when we had won the tender and we're in this rough table and political you know, environment. When I'm talking politics, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, government, but, you know, project politics. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and market politics, right? And um, we wanted to raise money and we, we couldn't raise money. It was because, you know, whenever there's lots of risk and uncertainty, nobody wants to touch you with the, even a stick. Yeah. Right? So, you know, I remember doing like 10 pitches, 10, 15 pitches and no money coming out. And then this is from the major investors. And now I'm a student entrepreneur and we as promoters and co-founders say, guys, we have to raise the money. Whether we like it or not, we're now at that stage. And you, we have to find it. It's going to be dollar for dollar. We have to subscribe for shares in the company, you know, over and above our sweet equity. And um, one of the valuable things that I had been talking about my ideas from the beginning with one of these close lawyers, of lawyer mentors of mine, so when I started all my tears and everything, I always kept my mentors in the loop to say, I'm doing this and that and that. This is where I am. Very good. Yep. Let people know what you're doing. Yeah. Exactly. So one important thing is to make friends before you need them. Because you know, do you know what happened? Right? At the, when we needed money and everybody had to go in their corner and look for money, I'm the youngest of them all and with the least amount of money. <laughs> and I have to find money so that my interest doesn't get diluted. And, this guy came through for me. He gave me money on a gentleman's agreement. I, you know, up to now, I don't still comprehend it, but we never even signed anything for it, but he gave oh me the my, money. Wow, you didn't sign anything. And he's a lawyer. <laughs> he's a lawyer, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave me, you know, thousands, of, you know, almost $100,000, right? And Well, it, that's, I think that's called trust. Exactly, because we had built that relationship over time. And it's easier to give a friend you trust. And for us, it was all about openness and transparency. I never kept anything from them. And when there was nothing good to say, you know, you have to be honest to say, look, this is what it is. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing because that's, those are difficult times where uh, you start questioning and how, you were still staying at your parents' place or did you have your own place? No, I was staying at my parents' place until about two and a half years ago. That's when I left my parents' place, yeah. So worse comes worse, you still have a bed to sleep in. <laughs> Exactly, a bed to sleep in and food to eat. <laughs> exactly. That's why it's good to start very early yeah, yeah. on. And I was, yeah, yeah, and I had uh, a qualification I was slowly but surely completing. So, yeah, I had that flexibility to take enormous risk and I had nothing to lose. I had more to gain than to lose. So that's a very unique advantage that student entrepreneurs have because you are in a situation where you don't have any risks. And uh, it's different if you're married, you've got a wife and kids. You can't take, you know, this, as many risks because you don't have a safety net somewhere. You have to provide for the family first. Exactly. Wow. So all that. But even though you have to provide for the family, some people, you can still start business later. But when you're younger, it's, it's you. You know, they always say the higher the risk, the higher the reward. So if you look at the, the new generation, the Twitters, Facebooks, all became billionaires when they were very young. Oh, yeah. So you ended up um, earlier this year, I think it was in Washington, D.C., for the Global Student Entrepreneurship Awards. How was it? How was it to be with other student entrepreneurs of Morley, your age? I mean, it was very interesting because we had the same, I think our stories, 
the challenges we had and the obstacles we had to overcome were almost all the same. And we all made great connections there. And uh, it was to know that, look, everywhere in the world is the same. It's not any different. So whilst in some countries you don't have one problem, you've got other problems to deal with. And sometimes you, we often underestimate what we have. And only when we meet someone that doesn't have access to a particular thing, then we see that. So, for example, over the years, I've managed to build relationships, very senior contacts. And, um, you know, I've even, you know, had meetings with the vice president of the country a couple of times. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one thing that, that I've seen is that, you know, some people would be dying to have such contacts, right, <laughs> to be able to do what they're trying to do. And then on the other end, I'm like, oh, okay, if I want to meet the vice president, I just have to make a few calls and I'll get an appointment set up. But um, then on the other end, in some countries in Europe, people underestimate that you've got PayPal and you can quickly set up an online business and it works. But like in this part of the world, we don't have electronic transactions and you have to find workarounds for a lot of things. So it was, it was quite interesting. Yeah, it takes time. and Yeah, and so one of the things that was also interesting in the States was networking with the EO members, the, the organization that had the old entrepreneurs organization. Very, a lot of great guys, some of millionaires and billionaires, but very humble people at the same time. You know, it's just amazing. And wanting to give their time to you guys, to student entrepreneurs there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The, you know, it's so humbling to know that, look, we are just students, but billionaires and millionaires and the vice president of JP Morgan is here to be here with us. So will you recommend uh, other people to apply for next year? Absolutely. Absolutely. Without, without blinking, you know. And, you know, the way I was invited to apply for this, I didn't even know about it. And, uh, you know, based on what I'd been doing in the Zimbabwe, one of the previous winners said, hey, Sam, there's something like this. You probably may want to apply. It might be of value. I remember I was in America at that time. And I was like, ah, okay, I'll apply. Then I just quickly put something together. And I'm like, ah, okay. It's probably the many nominations I make. And I just copied and pasted a lot of things and then submitted. And, well, at the end of the year, I was told, oh, you okay, you've been shortlisted. And uh, the experience was very great. Well, you did mention early on in the interview that uh, you double, triple, and quadruple check everything. So when something goes out, it's always perfect. So if you do, did a copy and paste of something, it was probably it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I, but, but but that it was copying and pasting of other submissions and adding a few extra words. <laughs> so those other submissions had already been perfect, and <laughs> I was just adding a bit more spice to it. <laughs> All right, Samuel, thank you so much for your time. Is there something else you do want to tell um, our listeners, like keep them motivated or any other words you want to add? Yeah, I'll say, look, you're a student entrepreneur and, uh, you know, people often say the sky is the limit. It's not even the limit, you know. You can achieve anything you want. And one of the simplest ways of identifying something that can make you money is looking at the problems you have in your society, you know, and finding a way of solving them in a way that can be monetized, right? And, uh, you know, there's always capital that's available for good ideas. And, you know, many people fail and say, oh, I can't start because I don't have capital. And it's a common notion that people have, but it doesn't take necessarily take money to make money. And you're saying that from a country where it's not easy to start a business because... Oh, yeah. Because um, that's the number one reason is like, oh, yeah, it's too, it's too expensive. I don't have the money, but you did it, right? <laughs> so... Yeah, exactly. It's not always about the money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Thank you so much. This was um, this was really uh, amazing. So um, all the best, and we'll uh, we'll track you on your Facebook page. I will share your Facebook page on the show notes, and your Twitter is at s d i m a i r h o. Correct. Yes, that's correct. And you'll be on a, on our website. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julian, for your time and thank you for being patient with me. Time to wrap up. Each student friend's story is different and what works for some people doesn't for others. However, I'd like to point out a few things in Samuel Demero's journeys that are similar to the student preneurs I studied in my research. He started 20 different ideas to succeed only a couple of times, but that's enough, right? It's another example of starting fast and failing fast. Also, he has been a big reader from very early on, which... It's how he changed his mind to become an entrepreneur. He also listens to a lot of audiobooks while commuting. So no excuse if you don't have time to read, you can listen to them. 
He studied very early, like at 14, with internship, from which he gained professional experience, but also made a lot of connections that started his network. As always, mentors play a great role in his entrepreneurship journey. He has several who have different areas of expertise. He met his first one at church. You never know where your first mentor will come from. Finally, he really enjoys the Global Student Entrepreneurship Award competition where he met like-minded student entrepreneurs and successful mature entrepreneurs. So apply now at gsea.org. If you enjoy this podcast, please review us on iTunes with five stars. And also please like the Studentpreneur Podcast Facebook page. Catch next episode of Studentpreneur on Wednesday, next week. Meanwhile, keep breaking the stereotype and the mindset.